want you, if you would, to stand with me as I read the Word today. In James chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, my message this morning is recover and re-engage. Recover and re-engage. James chapter 5, verse uh, 17 through 18. And uh, as you turn there, I want to encourage you to, uh, to get ready for 2019. I'm not, it's not about making resolutions today. I'm not going to talk about New Year's resolutions. I know some people do, some people don't. Uh, we're not even dealing with that today. We're dealing with what God can do for you or will do for you in this new year and uh, how he will help you as you move forward. James chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. Every Jewish believer knew Elijah and knew about Elijah. Matter of fact, I had a friend of mine say years ago, every southern preacher has a great sermon about Elijah. Elijah is a southern preacher, I can tell you. The way he does stuff, I can tell. He's like a, he's like a good southern evangelist. Um, but Elijah was a prophet. And here's what the Bible says. As James is talking about having, being righteous in our prayer, confessing faults to one another, and it says that Elijah was a man with, uh, just like us, had a nature just like us, and just like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Verse 18. Here's what it says. Verse 18, guys. It says this. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Think about that for a moment. He prayed. Got a man that was like us, who had passion, who had weaknesses and strengths. He prayed that it would not rain, and it didn't rain. And then verse 18 said he prayed it would rain, and it rained again. Now, there's a lot in between that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But let's pray for God's blessing on his word today. Father, we pray. We know your word's already uh, anointed. We just pray our ears would be anointed to hear. Our lips would be open to, to praise and worship you, and our heart would be open to receive everything you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. T today, this Sunday, is, it represents the end and the beginning it represents an end and a beginning. It's the end of, of one year today. It represents also the beginning of a new year coming in front of us. And uh, we're, we've had some great times. I was just thinking about uh, these. We still have our decorations up on purpose. I said, hey, let's leave them up through the new year. I wanted the lights to, to look good and all the decorations that Kim Gentry and her mother did were wonderful. But we're, we're excited about the new year. You can give a hand. We're excited about the new year, and as it comes in front of us, we look at it. And uh, some of us in this new year are looking at 2018 and saying it was a life-changing, incredible new, uh, 18 was great for you. You got married in 2018, Pastor Conrad and Klopp. You, you, got, you, you found out you're having a child in 2018, Pastor Alex and Taylor. Uh, others of us are 2018 have been incredible opportunities for us. 2018 were transition times for us. 2018, God moved you from Columbia or Blythewood to, to Buford, uh, John and Irene Perry. I mean, I'm just saying, there's a lot of good things that happen. And then at the same time, in that process, we know some of you in this room have had incidences in your life where 2018 has not been the greatest year. Sometimes your words are, you glad it's over. Amen, already. You're glad it's over. 2018 for you has been, I am ready for this season to be passed, and I'm ready to get on to the new year. 2018 can adios amigo, so I don't want to say it anymore. 2018, we look at the church, and there, there are some, some members of our church who were strong pillars, servants, workers in our church who died in 2018. And we still remember them. We still remember and recall uh, their faithfulness and commitment and prayer. We still remember and recall their service uh, even at, at Mr. Ken's uh, funeral service, I had a pair of his shoes. They're still in my office. And I put these shoes on the table right here and said, who's going to fill these shoes for a man who served and who did so much for this church? We passed in 2018. He died. 2018, uh, Walt Stokesbury passed. And we, we loved him. We love his family. And, and now we look at that back and we go, uh, who's going who's to take his place? Who's going to take his place with prayer and passion for children and families and, and for his own family, but passion and for rural rangers and the ministries here at the church for young people. Understand that we come to this place as a church saying that this 2018, whether we like it or not, is behind us, and now we are going into a new year. And it is smart, if you are a smart person in this room, and if you're wise, 
you are not going to run into next year saying if it was bad and I've got holes in my heart and it's been difficult, I'm just going to run from 2018 right into 2019 without stopping for a moment and asking God to recover and heal part of your hurting heart and to ask God to help you re-engage the right way. I, um, I know some of us in this room have had difficult times. Our hearts have been broken in 2018. And we've had some battles to go through. You know what we tell people? I tell people all the time that if you're getting out of a bad situation, don't jump right back into another one. You know what I'm talking about? You ever heard of them? Am I meddling in your business too much here? I tell people that, look, if you've had a bad situation, don't just jump right into another situation without learning something and being healed by the previous situation. In other words, God wants to bring healing to your hurt, and God wants to be recovery to your life. And some of us in this room, we know that it has been a tough year for us, but we're excited about the future. And God, in, I believe in his plan, has set aside, I believe, January for us as a church to be a place of recovery and re-engagement, a place of revival. I really believe January should be a month of revival. And I'm not talking about having meetings. I'm not talking about having, having meeting after meeting after meeting. I've been in meetings. Listen, I was in a church that we had, and we loved the pastors there. We loved the ministry there. But in Brownsville, we had a Brownsville revival type meeting in our church. For over a year, we had church every day, except one, it was two days a week we didn't have church. Every night we had church. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, two services on Sunday. Monday off, Tuesday off, not off from the office, but off from the church services, and started back again Wednesday through Sunday. And I know what it is to have meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And meetings are fine and wonderful. But meetings only serve a certain purpose if they get you to a place where God wants to do something in your own personal relationship with him. And so as a church, we're believing this next series we're coming up to next year in January is called Win Within. And in that series, we're going to encourage you to win the battle, not the battle out there, but the battle inside of your heart. We're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about ministry. We're going to talk about uh, overcoming thoughts, battling the good, fighting the good fight of faith, vision for your life. And all these things will be centered around winning this battle so you can truly recover and truly re-engage. Matter of fact, I'll go even further to say it like this. We have set aside a week of prayer that I think is through the 13th through the 17th or 18th, a week of prayer where we're asking you to spend time. We'll give you a sheet specifically praying for the ministries of the church and praying over your family, learning to have an encounter with God in prayer. The church will be open at 6 a.m. every morning that week except Friday. And Friday night we're having a night of worship. And we're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to do move in a prophetic way. We're just going to ask God to do whatever he wants to do that night because we believe God wants to do something. But that purposely is in place for one reason, for you to recover and to re-engage. To recover and re-engage. Sometimes I look at people, and this is not even, I didn't say it in the first service, but I feel stirred to say it. We look at people who do not learn from the past, and they will jump right back in, in their hurt, in their openness, in their wounds, in their pain, and they'll jump back in to something instead of letting God do a healing work. And instead of letting God do a healing work, they decide they know more. Don't you understand? I'm just not trying to be funny. God knows your heart. He loves you. But the enemy also knows your weaknesses, and he will point at those weaknesses, and he sees that hurt and pain. And the devil knows that if he touches that pain and hurts you again and brings something your way again that you think is good for you and it's not, that the enemy will try to bring you down. There needs to be healing. There needs to be wholeness. And so the Bible says that there needs to be wholeness in your life. And so the scripture we use today is about Elijah. Elijah, the, I just read it, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours who prayed fervently that it did not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. But I put this at the bottom. Dot, 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 dot. Why? Because from that time, and the next verse says, and he prayed again and rain came. That's a three and a half years between those two verses. Three and a half years. So it's not like it happened overnight. He prayed one day and it quit raining, and he prayed the next day it started raining. It's three years of prayer. But here's what happened in Elijah's life during that time. During that time, Elijah confronts a wicked king named Ahab. You heard of Ahab? Ahab was a wicked, henpecked king. 
He was a king that the, his wife bossed around. He had no strength to him. He did whatever his, his, uh, his wicked queen wife said, and he would do it. He was pagan. <clears throat> Excuse me. He should have been a worshiper of God. Instead, he worshiped Baal. And he was married to a wicked woman. You know her name? Jezebel. Jezebel was a wicked, wicked woman. Jezebel worshipped false gods and taught the nation to worship false god. The false god, Baal. Baal worship, part of it included the fires of Moloch, in which people, the, the Baal worshippers would heat up a stone and they would put their live baby on a stone and burn that baby alive. That's what Baal worship entailed. And Jezebel promoted it and was right in the middle of it. Jezebel had prophets killed. Jezebel hated the prophets of God, and she had them killed. Jezebel, when Ahab wanted the field of Naboth, the inheritance of Naboth, read it later, and Naboth would not give it to the king, the Bible says King Ahab got on his bed and pouted like a little baby. That's the Jamie Gardner version. That's what he did. He went in his bed and wouldn't say anything. That man wouldn't give me my field. I wanted that field. It's his. He wouldn't give it to me. And Jezebel said, you the king here, you get whatever you want. I'll take care of this. And she set up the man and had Naboth killed and then went back to him and said, okay, the field's yours. She's wicked, man. She is so evil that not only they talk about her in the Old Testament, in the book of Revelation, you find that they even talk about her in Revelation, about the spirit of Jezebel being in a church. She's a wicked woman. She was so wicked that when she died, the dogs ate everything but her hands because her hands were so wicked, the dogs wouldn't even eat that. Jezebel was bad. And Elijah went to Ahab and said, you and your wife had turned God's people away from him and turned to worshiping idols. And because of that, there is not going to be any rain. And he prayed and no rain showed up. The Bible says he went to the brook of Sherith and he stayed there for a while. It dried up. Then he, the Bible uh, says that Elijah was led to a widow in a place called Zarephath. A widow was there. A widow means poor in the Bible. Widow means, if you're a widow in the Bible, it means you don't have a lot. You're poor. And the widow had one son, and she had a few sticks and a little bit of bread, a little bit of flour, and she was going to make some, a bread, piece of bread, a pancake bread for her and her son, and that's all they had, and they were going to die. And the Bible says Elijah showed up and said, if you make that bread and you give it to me first, then God will take care of everything you need. It will never run out. And she, she said, according to the word of your God, I'll do it. It was an act of faith, not towards Elijah, but to God. She could have said, like some, some of us say, well, God, this is my bread. I'll do what I want to do with it. But instead, she said, I'm going to trust God with what I have. And when she did, God not only took care of her, Elijah's need, God blessed it to the point that the bread, never, the cruise of oil never ran out and the bread net never ran out. She always had food. It was a miraculous thing. She'd be out of flour, she'd put it away, and the next morning she'd come back and there's flour back in there again and she could make more biscuits. Why? Because God blessed her. And the scripture says her son died, Elijah prayed over him, he rose from the dead. Elijah leaves there, and the uh, next chapter, he, he confronts Ahab and says, let's have this showdown in Mount Carmel. I don't have time to get into the whole thing, but they meet at Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal and the prophets of God, 450 prophets of Baal, call on their God to bring fire from heaven to, to destroy the uh, altar and to consume the altar. Nothing happened. God did not, the prophets of Baal weren't there. Elijah called on God. God brought fire from heaven, destroyed the altar. If you don't know that, look it up in 1 Kings chapter 18. That day, a mighty victory happened. God showed himself to be the true God, not Baal. And the Bible says that God commanded Elijah to kill all the prophets of Baal, to get rid of this, and rain, he said, pray for rain to come, and rain came back. Think about Elijah's life for a moment. Elijah went from a man who says, there's not going to be any prayer, not be any rain. He, God answers that prayer. He raises a kid from the dead by the power of God. He provides for a woman's physical need. He is a man who calls on God, and God brings fire from heaven. He's a man who does God's will, and he's a man who's in the middle of everything God's called him to do. He is a man who is doing great things for God, and God was blessing him. And then in verse chapter 19 of 1 Kings, after all the miracles, here's what the Bible says. It says in 1 Kings 19, Ahab the king told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. And verse 2 says this, when Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me or even more so if i don't take your life as one make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow verse three and he was afraid and ran for his life 
this man of God who commands the clouds not to rain, and they don't rain. This man of God who, who proclaims that God show himself true and fire falls from heaven. A widow's son is sick and he raises him from the dead. Dead, raises him from the dead. This man of God who is miraculous, who calls on God, who does miraculous works and says, let rain come, and rain comes back. This man of God hears one word by a demon-inspired woman and it terrifies him. It gets him to a place where he forgets all the victories. He forgets all the answers to prayer, and he forgets all the things that have happened. He is now gripped by fear, and he's afraid. Some of you have been there before. You know what I'm talking about. It's that moment where something comes your way, and you think, I'm going to lose everything I have. Or a word comes down to you, and you think, I'll never recover from this. Or, as I heard people say recently, I, I, I'm, I'm so terrified, I'm so afraid, I'm so discouraged that I would rather just go to sleep and never wake up again. Or maybe you understand this because you've been at that place where things have happened, great things have happened, victory's been in your life, then suddenly someone says something, something happens in you, and the enemy brings the worst case scenario to happen in your life. It's you go to the doctor and, and you find your, you, you, your arms hurting a little bit and, and the devil tells you, well, that's cancer. And all it was is you didn't lift, you didn't stretch before you worked out that day. But what the devil will do is the devil will bring the worst case scenario in your life to give you, get you to a place where you want to give up and quit. And some of us in this room, you've gone through some things lately and you know God's answered prayer for you and you know God's been on the scene for you. You know the miracles he's done and you know the victories he's brought you. But right now, your focus hasn't been on that. All you've been hearing lately is the words of Jezebel speaking to your mind, speaking to your heart that you're going to fall. Do you understand Jezebel said by this time tomorrow you'll be dead? That's a lie. She was wrong. She didn't know what she was talking about. By the end of the story, Elijah's in heaven with Jesus. With, 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 look, rat goes into, well, I would call the rapture, goes into a chariot of fire into heaven with God, and Jezebel's dead, eaten by dogs. So the liar is the devil, and the devil is a liar. But this word got so discouraged into him that he forgot the victories that God had brought. And you and I have done this many times. I talked to a man between services who told me, he said, I came to church today. My wife was sick, but my wife said, there's a word for you at church today. He said, I'm carrying the load of my whole family. I'm carrying the load of my friends. I'm carrying a heavy load. And my whole family looks to me. And I found recently telling myself, I am tired, and I want to give up. And this is a man who is prestigious and family looks to him. And he said, I want to give up. He said, but you know what? That word is for me because God has always answered prayer. And God has done miracles for me. And he has shown up on the scenes. And how did I forget so easily God's faithfulness? I, I, I could tell you in this room today, we are not in heaven yet. And because of that, we will have great victories, but also we will have great battles. Amen. I, I've told the staff and I've told other ministries that ministry is a humbling thing. In ministry, you will have great victories, but at the same time, there'll be great battles. In ministry, there'll be great things happening on one end, and on the other end, there'll be discouragement. You can go one week with being, feel like you can do anything, and the next week, you want to turn in your resignation. Because that's how the devil works. You know I'm telling you the truth in this room. That's how the devil works. The devil will make you feel like you can't go any further. He will get you out, get out of your mind any victory God has ever brought for you and mute the, victory, the words of God and let you only hear the words of the enemy. And the Bible says that as Elijah runs, he goes somewhere. He goes to a place by himself. Notice what the Scripture says in 1 Kings Verse 4 says, he went a day's journey into the, verse 19, chapter 19, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. I'm talking about the same guy who called fire from heaven. The same guy who said, clouds, no rain. The same guy who raised a widow's son from the dead. And the same guy that saw God provide every need for a widow. The same man is here saying, I want you, it's, I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. And the scripture says, And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a, at his head a cake, ba a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank, and he lay down again. 
it, it's that place that Elijah is demonstrating the spiritual depression, right? He is so discouraged, and he doesn't know what to do. He wants to die, and he wants to quit. And God looks at him and says, it's not time for you to quit. I've got a meal for you. In this story, God provides two meals for him. One meal is the meal of recovery. He wanted to die, and he wanted to give up, and he slept. But God says, I've got bread for you. I've got refreshments for you. I need you to get better. I know you're weary. I know you're depressed. I know you're tired. I know it's rough. But I want you to wake up for a moment, rest for a while, wake up for a moment, eat this bread, drink what I have for you, and rest some more. That's called the meal of recovery. In this room, there's some of us that need to remember during this next few weeks that we're in a recovery process. See, the Bible says he was sitting under the broom tree. I don't have a broom tree, I have an evergreen. He was sitting under the broom tree. And as he's sitting under the broom tree, the broom tree in the Bible, in Job, I believe chapter 30, the broom tree represents a place of discouragement and defeat. Ashes represents a place of poverty. The broom tree in Psalm represents a place of judgment. The broom tree in Genesis chapter, I think, 29 or 39, represents the place that Ishmael was left to die. And it's under that broom tree that Elijah says, I can't go on any further. And it's under the broom tree God says, hang on a minute. I've got something for you. Rest and food and recovery. What's your broom tree this morning? What broom tree have you been sitting under? What broom tree are you sitting under right now? You've kind of found yourself at a place where you just want to sit there. You don't want to go on any further. You're kind of at this place where you feel numb. I, listen, I, I, I hate feeling down, and I hate feeling, you know, I don't like going to extremes in my emotions. I understand people that do. I understand that I do that sometimes. I don't like that. But I'd rather feel something than feel nothing. And I'm not talking about being down and depressed. I'm not, I don't want to feel down and depressed. What I'm saying is I would rather feel joy than feel numb. And you're maybe at a broom tree right now in your life right now where you're at a place where you feel numb. You feel one, you quits, all, quits written all over your face. Here's what God says to you. God says to you, this is a place of recovery for you. You, you need to recover. God is going to bring healing to you. God's going to, listen, these next three weeks, if you let him in the series we're going in, God is going to lift you up out of that heaviness and bring some healing to your body. It's a meal of recovery. It's a meal of recovery God wants to give you. God wants to bless you. Listen, some of you, 2018 was rough. God wants to recover you. Some of you, the difficulties are still in front of you. God wants to strengthen you. God wants to build you up. You will never learn by staying where you are and never getting up. But God says, take a moment, rest, and let me bring healing to your heart. There's two meals. This man after God, who loves God, who man after our passion, just like us, he had two meals. One was a meal of recovery. One was a meal under the broom tree that says, yes, I need to be restored. Listen, I don't know if you forgot this or not. I don't know where you are, but you know God does have joy for you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. There is peace available. To this morning, there is hope, and it can be restored. There can be a song in your heart, and God can bring recovery to you. Just a few weeks ago, we were out of town and went to a service. And in the service, uh, my family can tell you that for two days, I was so wrecked uh, by a worship experience. that uh, for, uh, And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not making this up. Uh, for two days, I was so wrecked. One day on a Monday, uh, nobody was in here, just me in this sanctuary. I turned some music on, and I just laid and wept for about half the morning. I had to finally quit doing that because I've got work to do. But I just wept and just worshiped and worshiped and, and, and wept and joyfully shouted and said, God, I love you. And, and the next morning, the same thing. And, and let me tell you what happened to me. Let me tell you what happened in my life. It was God bringing about some of, the, some, of the, some of the open wounds in my heart and some of the empty spots in my life and some of the things that after a while you get, you know, after a while you get pounded a bit and you're like, I need, some, I need some recovery. It is at those moments that in a moment God did something. You know what I know about God? And you know this too, and I'm telling you this as a reminder, that God can do in about five seconds what you've been trying to do for five years. God, listen, I, I, am, I am not because I'm a guy, and I don't know how all you guys think or ladies think, but guys try to figure it out and try to wonder what's going on and try to figure out every little thing and how that happened, how this happened, how this going to get, how we can get this fixed. I, 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 I try to do that sometimes, but God reminded me, and you saw it on my post recently, God reminded me that he is God and I'm not God. 
and he is in charge, and I'm not in charge. And he reminded me that his love and presence is still real. And I remember just being in this place, in his presence, worshiping by myself, nobody around, and God just bringing a recovery to my heart. And it wasn't anything I did. It was his supernatural grace showing up on the scene. And some of you need that meal from God today, a meal of recovery. And these next three, four weeks, you're going to get that. You're going to get a meal of recovery. You're going to get something where healing takes place in your heart and restoration takes place in your mind. And you don't go from, go from woundedness to woundedness, but you go, the Bible says, from glory to glory. There's a second meal that was given to Elijah. And there was a second meal that encouraged him. I believe it's the meal of encourage, to, to energize him. The Bible says after Elijah ate and he fell asleep again, verse 7, it says the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. The journey's too great for you. And he rose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food for 40 days. Think about it. Here's Elijah who has had a meal so he could recover from his weariness. And God recovered him and he got another meal to give him strength for the journey ahead. Because if we always live in recovery, we'll never move beyond the broom tree. He says, I'm going to recover you, but when you're better, get out from the broom tree. I've got something for you. And the very strength that recovers you, the very strength that helps you move forward and do what he's called you to do, the, the meal to re-engage. He gets up and, and he moves and he goes to where God tells him to go. And the Bible says, and the few verses after that, it says, Elijah was standing in front of the cave and God asked him, what are you doing here? And Elijah said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, God of, God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left. And God says, go out and stand before the mountain of the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Notice this, the Lord passed by. And the scripture says that he passed by in a strong wind, so strong that it broke the mountains in pieces and rocks were torn before him. But the Bible says the Lord was not in the wind. You going with me, right? After the wind, there was an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. After the fire, he was not in the fire. There was fire available, not in the fire. After the fire was a low whisper. And Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance. And listen, and God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, God of hosts. The people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets, and I am only one left. And God says to him, go. Here's what he tells him to do. Anoint Helzel king, anoint Jehu king, go and anoint Elisha to be a prophet in your place. And he says there'll be great victory. In verse 18, he says, and I have left 7,000 Israel who have not bowed their knee to Baal. What does that mean? What, 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 what does all that mean? Here's what it means. Elijah got this meal of recovery. He ate again and he went. God said, now get, get up, I've got something for you to do. It's a meal of strength energy re-engage and then he says this to him he looks at him and says why are you here elijah and elijah said lord i'm the only one serving you i'm the only one going after you everybody else is is not with me and you know what he, he tells god how he's feeling you know what god does you know what god does there he ignores him he ignores what he said Lord, I'm the only one serving you. I'm the only one doing right. I'm the only one, and I'm tired, and, and they want to kill me too, and I wish I was dead. That's what he said earlier, and I, I don't want to go any further, and God just ignored that. Notice it. It's in the Bible. He ignored it. He said, well, what did God do? The Scripture says God showed up in a whisper. Showed up first. He, he demonstrated a wind, but God wasn't there in the wind. Elijah knew. I didn't hear the voice of God. There was an earthquake. Not in the earthquake. Fire appeared. Wasn't in the fire. But in the whisper. In the whisper. Why is that important? It's important because when Elijah was going to his next place of duty, he needed to know that God is in the whisper. Why is that? Because if I'm talking to you, I like to talk loud. I'm loud, man. I like to talk loud. I laugh loud, talk loud, yell loud. Don't the Chelsea. God, I'm going to be loud. But the God that we serve, Elijah needed to know, was the God who whispers. Because you only whisper when you're close to somebody. 
See, I can talk loud to everybody up here. I can just talk to everybody, Conrad. I can talk to Pastor Conrad and Clive. I can just talk to Kim and just talk loud. Hey, how you doing? Whatever. But if I really want to tell her, her something that is really between me and her, I'm not going to tell everybody. Oh, by the way, I ran up the credit card $1,000 this morning. Just want you to know that. No, I'm kidding. I didn't. <laughs> but whatever I tell her, Why do you do that? I do it in a whisper because we're close to each other. She can hear me. If I'm trying to talk to you in the back and I try to whisper to you, you don't hear anything I'm saying. You can only hear what I'm saying if I'm whispering when I'm close to you. And God is saying, Elijah, you need to understand I'm close to you. Amen. And then he says, not only am I close to you and you're not alone, I've got thousands who haven't. You think you're the only one? You're not the only one. There are thousands who haven't bowed their knee. What is God saying? God is saying to you this morning that you need the meal of recovery and the meal of reengagement. But when you do what God's called you to do, you are not alone when you do it. You have God near you, helping you, and you have people around you who are following, who are following God too, who are with you. You know why? I'm going to preach so get ready, you bat sound people. Let me tell you why. It's because there are still people that need to be reached. There is still a family that you need to lead. You still have to be a husband. You still have to be a wife. You still have grandkids that you need to help raise. You still have children in your house. You still have people that need your influence and need your leadership. And you can't just lick your wounds forever. God says there's healing. You need to get up. There's still mountains to climb. There's still victory in front of you. There's still things to do. And you need to know you don't stay under the tree, but get up in my power. And when you go, the whispering God who is close to you is near you. It's near you. And so when Jezebel's words start coming to you, the devil says to you, you're going you're gonna to be throwing the towel. You're not going to make it. You don't listen to those loud words of Jezebel. You listen to the whisper of the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. When you hear the devil say, you're going to fail, understand there's a whisper of the Holy Spirit telling you, though many fall at your right hand, they will not get you, for you are my child. When you hear the enemy tell you that there is destruction in front of you and you'll never make it and nobody will ever love you and nobody will ever be for you, you stop for a moment and listen to God saying, you are mine, and I delight in you, and you are my precious, and you will never, ever, ever give up. Don't ever give up. Be strong in me, in the power of your might, his might. When the enemy will try to lie to you, you need to re-engage, and don't just recover. Don't just stay here saying, I'm getting better. Get up and saying, I'm going forward. I will not be paralyzed. If I had a microphone, y'all really be shouting. And I will not be paralyzed any longer. I will not be paralyzed under the broom tree anymore. I will not be paralyzed under this area I'm in anymore. I am tired of being paralyzed. I am tired of being stuck. I'm tired of doing the same thing. I'm tired of being at the same place. I'm tired of doing the same routine. And God's saying, yes, let me pick you up and go to what I've called you to do. That's where you are. That's where God has you. And so the whisper of the Spirit says to you, I've got you ready. I'm giving you a meal to strengthen you. You've got a job to do, and it's time to move forward. Worship team, come if you would. Come if you would, please. Come if you would. Because this is the time. In these next few weeks, I'm asking you to take two meals from the Lord. Would you receive them? A meal of recovery. God Bring breakthrough to my heart. Heal my brokenness. Strengthen me out of my weariness. Lift me up out of this heavy place. And a meal of re-engagement. Lord, give me the strength to do what I've got to do. And I can't do this on my own. But I've got you, Jesus. And you're my whispering closer than any brother God who speaks to me when it's difficult. And reminds me I'm not alone. I mean, you need to know that today. I'm looking at this room, and I know people online have been through some difficult spots, some difficult places. And some of us, we look at 
our lives and we say, God, only by your grace have we made it so far. Others of us are so in despair under the broom tree. God is speaking to your heart. He wants to help you recover, pull you out, and make you go forward. Elijah was a man that liked passions like us, but it was used by the Lord. Amen. Would you bow your hearts with me? Heavenly Father, we are touched by this word today. God, as we end 2018 and go into 2019, we pray for recovery. We pray, God, that you would help us recover, not only spiritually, but, Lord, things we've lost. Help us recover things we've lost. And we pray, Lord, as we move into 2019, that you help us to re-engage with fire and passion like we've never before. And, Lord, we pray. We, we know you can do it in a day, in a moment. And, Lord, these next few weeks we're setting aside to win within, to win this battle, Lord, of healing of our hearts and re-engagement to our future. And, Father, we thank you that this is the beginning of the year, the end of this year, beginning of next year, that we can do these things. And we trust you, Lord. We're leaning on you and asking for your help. We're resting in your strength right now. And, Father, in just a moment, God, as, as people come to an altar, Lord, and as they are prayed for, I just pray that encounter would happen and begin something. And these next few weeks, we would celebrate the breakthroughs you're bringing. Father, we praise you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our ushers are coming. We, we, just, we do this because if we, we missed you from the Christmas offering and you've not been able to give, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. And Pastor Conrad mentioned about cards to turn in for night to shine. This is another opportunity to do that. But our worship team is going to sing, and then Pastor Conrad is going to give you a little bit of instruction in just a moment. But my, my word to you is allow God to ne- use these next few weeks through worship and training and you know, get, get evangelism training. If you want to sign up for that, go in the foyer. There's some forms out there. Through worship and the word and prayer and fasting, I encourage you to fast. God's going to bring some healing to some hearts in this room. God, listen, I believe God's going to not only recover you, God's going to re-engage some of, you, some of us in this room. He's going to re-engage us. God's going to use us in a powerful way. So as we worship the Lord in this time, and again, the moment Pastor Conrad will be here, um, be faithful in giving, be faithful in your worship, and let God have his way in your heart. Amen? Father, we're open. We're open to the Spirit of God and what he desires to do in us. Lord, we pray, God, you would give us total recovery and power to re-engage, not laying aside, not staying under the broom tree and just living there, getting up from there and living the life you want us to live. In Jesus' name.